Shabam, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Great to be here, Ryan. Awesome. So I think you have a really valuable perspective on the oil markets because you have experience working, you know, boots on the ground in the oil field, and now you're an oil field investor. So could we share with our listeners a bit of your background and then also what inspired you to start White Tundra Investments and how long you've been involved in oil and gas and investing in the field for? Yeah, you bet. So when I started my uh, petroleum engineering at the University of Alberta 2013, um, you know, obviously the uh, the a university known for its petroleum engineering program, the oil and gas exposure that it has being being the closest to uh, Fort McMurray, some of the oil sands, some of the conventional plays. Um, really, it was a it was a match. If I'm going to be doing petroleum engineering, I almost have to be invested in the sector because you get so specialized in that. So about uh, September 2013, I started both the program and my investment in the sector. Not a great time to be starting investments, obviously, given how the market went uh, 2014, 15, 16. But at the same time, it was a great, great sort of learning experience. And I was call it passively investing in oil and gas uh, throughout my degree. I used to work in the field, as you mentioned, uh, boots on the ground, get information from people that that used to say, hey, you should buy this, you should buy that. And this is why you should buy it. And you know, people didn't didn't really have the most technical explanations, but they had uh, some understanding of the well results and the acreage and everything else. So really, that's where the base of everything started. Um, at the same time, as I said, I I kind of graduated from the petroleum engineering program, worked in the field. Um, in 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 2018, when I graduated, went to work for a, a small private producer. I've worked for all all kinds of producers: gas, oil, uh, NGL, heavy oil. Um, small producers, private juniors to the CNRLs of the world. So really wanted to get my full understanding as to what's happening. Uh, 2018, when I graduated, went to a tiny thousand barrel per day producer in the Lloydminster area. I really wanted to uh, not just operate wells and do field engineering, but also take control of the field. So really, those opportunities are only uh, possible in the small junior companies. Uh, did that for about a year. And then I said, hey, you know, let me launch my own thing. So I launched at the time White Tundra Resources which became a sort of field uh, engineering, field operations, production operations, optimization company. Uh, I had one singular client up in Grand Prairie, worked a lot uh, for them. And at the same time, the market was, was kind of getting interesting in 2019. We saw shale, shale kind of start to flatline. We saw some of the uh, demand numbers continue to go up. The overall economy was doing relatively good. Worldwide demand continued to go up. And uh, then, then sort of COVID happened. And the bottom fell out, obviously, as we know. And I said, hey, this, this is the time that I need to really go into this. So, so every dollar that I was making was going into oil, uh, oil and gas investments. At the same time, I was working 300, 350, 400 hours a month. Things were really tight in the field level, um, just, just given some of the dynamics around labor. And then the COVID time itself, we had some other uh, labor issues start to get even more uh, at the time. So, yeah, just did that for about... Uh, Almost a year and a half, we got bought out by Tourmaline at the time, the, the producer I was mm -hmm. working with. And then early 2021, uh, the markets had done had done really, really well, um, especially the first three or four months of 2021. We had this big bounce back uh, kind of time. And I said, hey, you know, I, I want to bet on myself. I think it's time that I stop making money for for other people, other ENPs. Let me let me try this on my own. Um, so. Before I did that, I took about six months off with some buddies. I went traveling down in the States and Mexico, had a great time, got my got my mind sort of properly focused on what I wanted to do. And then um, late fall, fall of 2021, I launched White Tundra Investments. And uh, really, it, it came about from one singular conversation I had, uh, uh, which, which gave me confidence. Uh, I had a conversation with Paul Coburn of, of Surge. He's the CEO of Surge, which was, was at the time my biggest holding. And... Just, the conversation just went so smoothly and so good where I was asking him questions that that maybe a lot of analysts wouldn't ask. They'd be scared to ask him. And I said, hey, I can do this. I can I can be the liaison between the high net worth retail or the family office and the the management and the and the C-suite. Not that that was a plan at the time, but just kind of said, hey, let me launch this. Let's see where it goes. Uh, my buddy Sohaib said, hey, you should, you know, maybe be active on Twitter a bit more. You can do these sessions. People are are craving information and they're hungry for it. Mm -hmm. And I started doing these Sunday Zoom sessions and the rest is history, as they say. So over time, we've built up our, our Twitter following. We've built up the YouTube Zoom sessions. Uh, at the same time, White Tundra has become more of a 
uh, face for the market, let's say, um, in the, once again, in the high net worth retail, small family office space, where, where we're the liaison between the companies and the investors. And then most recently, as you may have seen, we, we have now started uh, creating our own private placements into junior companies, where we see opportunity to give, not just from a capital allocation standpoint, but also from an engineering background, we come mm -hmm. in not just as investors, we come in as technically focused business developers along with the capital allocation at a time that the uh, company needs it most. So really it's a blend, it's a dynamic process, and I'm really excited to see where 2023 goes along with the rest of our legacy uh, initiatives, let's say. Yeah, that's incredible. And looking at your website, you have everything out in the open, which is, you know, there's nowhere to hide. You can see your positions and your personal portfolio what White Tundra is invested in, and it's all laid out in a nice pie chart and uh, very cool stuff. Yeah, so this show, Understanding Macro, what we what I want to start off with here is, let's do a quick snapshot. It's end of Q1, 2023. The sky appears to be falling. Banks are failing all over the place in Europe and in the US. You know, where do you think we are in the business cycle at the moment? Yeah, so this is a very, very interesting question. I think it's one that uh, we have to view it through a different sort of lens. So the investing landscape, when when we use the word investing, you know, it's, it's in a different definition these days. Investing used to be 5, 10, 20, 40 year holding timeframes, even as early as 10 years ago. But since the COVID time, since we've had this influx of, of investors and traders, people managing their own portfolios going forward, the investment time frame has really shortened a lot. People are really reliant on what happened this quarter, what happened this month, what is the day-to-day -day news release, what is the monthly CPI. It's like this very uh, aggressive market on steroids that's happened. So when we go, go back into commodity investing, it's more of a cycle investing. Commodities go in cycles, there's your up cycles, then you have an over overinvestment, which leads to oversupply, then you have a down cycle, then you have underinvestment, undersupply leads to an up cycle, and the, and the charade uh, continues, or the cycle continues, I guess you can say. So that is a five to seven to 10 year cycle in the oil industry. Historically, it's been that sort of length. So where we are now is at our, what I would call the, the 2022 was sort of the panic stage. Hey, oil prices have really got out of hand, the, the the markets have got overheated, we don't have the supply, we need to release the SPR, we also, China needs to shut down, we also need every barrel online from Libya, Russia needs to get its act together and get their barrels back, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was this, this panic stage. And what happened is the world turned its attack towards oil. It was like, we need oil prices down, we need natural gas, uh, gas prices down. Part of that was the SPR release, Part of that is the political job owning, the Twitter feeds and the, you know, uh, 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 we're going to windfall tax you if you don't get your act together sort of thing. And then on top of that, the Fed, look at what the Fed has done, the highest rate, uh, a rate hiking cycle in the near history. So there's a lot of things going against oil The the DXY dollar index is at 102. It, it got as high as 115, right? So there's a lot of factors going against oil and we're in this lull in the market where the physical market is not tight enough at this exact point where we are today in order to pull the financial markets higher. At the same time, the financial markets are not in a good space. As you mentioned, some of the banks are failing. Some of the liquidity is lower. The companies themselves have stopped hedging. So they're not in the market to the same extent that they were maybe even two or three or five years ago. So there's a, there's a lack of open interest. The financial market, nobody wants to go and say, hey, I'll buy the oil contract today or in six months, they say, oh, we'll just wait. Why should we put up the margin at a very high interest rate to then go and, and make a bet on oil prices? We'll just steer the market. When the time comes, the barrel's there. What fixes it? A physical market tightness. And I think that's where we're headed. Uh, maybe I think we'll discuss more as the as the uh, session here continues, but, but that's, that, that's gonna be your warning sign that, hey, once the physical market is tight, watch out because not only is the barrel going to start getting bid up, but the financial markets are going to say, Hey, we really need this barrel and we may not have it six months down the road. Let's buy it right now. And that itself pulls the financial market up. It becomes this double whammy effect 
uh, which I think we're still waiting for. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but lower oil prices creates more of an undersupply. Uh, so, so the longer we stay sub 80, sub $90 a barrel, the higher the cycle goes and the longer it stays there for because of just the way supply demand dynamics work. And uh, the world is uh, growing its thirst for oil that has never stopped. It continues on. And now we have more billions of people wanting what we have here in the Western world. Agreed. And you mentioned that these cycles are typically five to seven years. So when do you think this cycle started for oil? Was that when oil crashed and went negative? Was that kind of the bear, like literally the bottom of the barrel for lack of a, you know, no pun intended. And we got to about seven years of runway ahead of us for this cycle to kind of express itself and come to fruition. Or where do you think we are on that five to seven year time frame? Ah, uh, absolutely excellent question. And one that I did want to address here kind of moving forward. So 2020 was your getting out of the COVID panic trade. Everything made money in 2020. No matter what you bought, it was all, all doing well. 2021 was your reopening trade. It was like, okay, we now have some stability. We're now reopening towards normalcy. Once again, everything went up. On top of that, they printed a lot of money. The money supply went up. I think it's 40%, was it, in just mm -hmm. a matter of um, a couple of years. So 2021 was your money printing and your return to normalcy trade. Mm -hmm. 2022 was your differentiation year, where oil prices really skyrocketed. Some say it was the beginning of the cycle. You can argue both ways. I think 2022 was a bumper year, let's say. So companies got a chance to fix their balance sheets, pay off debt, initiate dividends, initiate buybacks. Some of them bought back 10, 12, 15% of their floats in 2022. And, mm -hmm. and looking back now, I'm saying in hindsight, not saying this is what I thought when 2022 started. I'm saying looking back in hindsight, 2022 was a bumper year. Some of the companies benefited from the higher pricing. The ones that were unhedged made a lot of cash. They fixed up their balance sheets. They fixed up everything. And now the cycle has not even yet started. The cycle is going to start when we see that physical market get tight and that first stage back to 80, 85, $90 a barrel begins. From that standpoint, you can say there's another five, seven, 10 year runway. I don't want to make claims as to how long the cycle is going to be right now because it's a supply demand game. If demand continues to overshoot the way that is projected, we don't have the investment in supply to do anything about it. If for some reason there are other factors where there's some, the, the Fed continues to hike to higher rates and demand is artificially lowered, maybe the cycle is going to be a, a more jagged, bumpy cycle uh, going forward. But I think the cycle really is beginning. When I look back to December 2019, I said shale is flatlining here. The cycle is now in its lull period after which it begins. Well, we are now in that lull period, three more years of shale inventory down the drain, wasted money. Demand continues to rise at very, very high rates, especially in the Asian market. Um, and at the same time, we see shale, shale and overall supply not responding. They did not respond in 2022. They didn't care what the price of oil was. They wanted to pay back debt and give dividends and do buybacks. And mm -hmm. if that mandate continues, that mindset continues, we're going to be in for one hell of a cycle here, uh, which, which could be the cycle that just continues on and on. Because let's be honest with, with ourselves, oil is not a unlimited resource like a video game. There's mm -hmm. real geologic and real physical, physics, chemistry components to it. And we'll see how that goes uh, this cycle on. If, if we can't find the right quantity of oil at the cheap enough price, we're going to have a cycle that continues on with a new base moving forward. And then the cycle's base is going to be $100 to $150 a barrel with gyrations up and down on the upside as opposed to the downside. So definitely one, one thing to kind of think, think about as you continue on. Oil price in 2000 was $20 a barrel. We never got back there for any sort of sustained period other than mm -hmm. a once in a, once in a century pandemic. So new base, hard for longer cycle. Very interesting. So let's talk about the supply and demand dynamic right now. So when we factor in global decline rates and active supply coming onto the market over the next couple of years and existing supply, how tight of a market is it currently for oil and gas at the moment? And is that is there going to be an inflection point kind of once we get out of this muddling of the 
kind of economic environment. And that's going to be the point where you're going to see that hockey stick when now WTI is trading at 120, 150. Uh, but let's start with what's the global supply and demand look like for oil at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So the the important point that I want to make with, with, with this sort of question is before the invention of shale or or let's say the aggressive development of shale, we had our conventional oil cycle. So when prices would start rising, companies would start investing. And the reason they were five to seven year cycles is because it took about five to seven years to bring production online. If I wanted to invest today in Kazakhstan, conventional oil, if I wanna invest in Iraq, in the Kurdistan region, it's about five to seven years to really scale up my field by the time I get all the uh, regulatory approvals, I get the drilling rigs on site, I get a field development plan, I build out the infrastructure, and I get the full scale field production, five to seven years. That's why the cycles work like that. What happened is 2014 to 2020, all the investment that was made in 2012 to, to, to 14 came online. So we still had this conventional oil trickling onto the market that was invested in beforehand, think Canadian oil sands, think the Iraqi production, think UAE, and, and, and some of the Brazilian fields. So now that cycle is no longer there. So that, that trickling of extra conventional oil every single year ended in about 2021 with the Johan Spurt of field in Norway that came online 500,000 barrels per day, really brought on that last conventional piece Kashagan field in uh, Kazakhstan was the other example. Uh, 2018, I believe, three, four, five 500,000 barrels per day. So these fields are now no longer coming online. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you mentioned decline rates. Scale decline rates are two, three, four times what the conventional oil decline rates are on an on a overall uh, wedge basis. So when we go into 2023 and, and forwards, we no longer have the conventional supply every year. Scale has a hard decline rate, which means we need to bring more oil per year just to sustain our production, our global oil production. At the meantime, oil demand continues rising about mm -hmm. a million barrels per day, about that 1% number. So are we extremely tight in terms of supply right now? I don't, I don't really think so. No, not, not right at this moment, mm -hmm. but three, six, 12 months down the road, we're going to get into this massively undersupplied sort of market, especially as Asia reopens and brings on this, this influx of demand with it. And that's really where the problem is, is the, the gyration between where we are right now and between mm -hmm. where we will be when the cycle hits is just so large that the, I mean, in 2022, they had to release 222 million barrels out of the SPR to control that. This year, they don't have that. And demand is going to be even higher because China is no longer in its lockdown phase and Asia is reopening and the Russian barrels at some point when that's going to happen, we don't know, they will drop. Uh, we're seeing no supply response. So mm -hmm. that's really at the crux, at the base of this undersupplied bull thesis is you can do whatever you want in the world. You can have recessions, you can have whatever. You're not fixing the supply problem. Mm -hmm. To fix the supply problem, you need more investment in supply. We didn't see it even at $100 oil. So really the appetite to invest in new supply is not there until the companies make boatloads of money until they re which is, I think the investment thesis that we're all, all sort of betting on is both a increase in oil price and a re-rating of the stock before the companies invest in new supply. And that's what we're seeing in terms of the mindset of the ENP uh, management teams at this point in time. Got it. And can we talk a little bit about the SPR releases that have happened over the past year or so and how much of an impact you think that had on the oil markets and what it's going to look like when those caverns need to be filled up with oil again? Is that just going to be another tailwind behind demand that's going to you know, drive prices even higher potentially? Yeah, so 100%. Um, I, don't, I don't put any single barrel of refilling the SPR in my modeling. Uh, because I don't think it's required. And I don't think the U.S. can even refill that many barrels of oil if they really wanted to, especially not at the price that they're saying they're going to. Um, at the same time, the U.S. had a mandate, congressionally approved mandate, to lower the volume in the SPR anyway by 2030. So those barrels have kind of been front-loaded. If you can see what I mean, they were going to release 30 million per year. 
they instead released six or seven years worth in one year mm. uh, is what they did. But 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 really, what the SPR has done has been very effective. I got to give kudos to the Biden administration. They have been very effective with the SPR, not just with the physical barrels they put on the market, but the political messaging that got put out with it that, hey, we're going to we're going to control this market for now. You know, don't be worried. We're going to support the global crude oil balance this year. Now, what's the problems with that? The first problem is they don't have the barrels anymore in a real crisis. Mm -hmm. So one could say 2022 was a real crisis. You know, I'll I'll not argue those points. I'll just say they don't have the barrels anymore to use. The second point is they affected the, the supply response. So in 2022, if crude was above $110 a barrel for nine months, 12 months, you would have seen some projects on the margin start to get approved. Even though not everybody was going to go drill, baby drill, and blow their brains out, you would see some changes on the margin. You would see some banks say, hey, maybe we should, we should give these projects some money. Maybe it's time to get back into oil and gas. Mm -hmm. All that is a complete kaput zero. Because they brought the oil price down, even in Q4, we started to see rigs drop uh, in the American shale. We started to see some Canadian projects get pushed back. We started to see some global projects get pushed back. And now sitting here where we are, they pushed the price down even more because of the financialized metric. And this is going to have a long lasting impact to supply. It's also going to have a long lasting impact to demand, which continues to go higher, the lower oil price is. So when I mentioned earlier, the, the difference between where we are right now and where we're going is just getting wider and wider. The SPR has made a even more impact to that which is not going to be seen until we get there. When we get there and that physical barrel is not there and then the financial markets also pick up, that's when people are going to say, uh-oh, we, we really should have invested in supply. Um, and, and guess what the reality of oil is? And I think we'll discuss this later on. When you decide you want to invest in supply, it doesn't work at the snap of your fingers, unfortunately. This is not a AI. This is not a tech. This is not a video game. It takes years and years to get the supply. And those years are what we would call our uh, life-changing generational wealth making years, uh, you know, going forward for those investors who are new into the oil and gas sector. Got it. And I could not have asked for a better segue into what does it look like today to get new oil capacity online to make sure that supply can meet the future demand moving forward. What does that process look like? how much infrastructure is involved, you know, what are we looking at from a year's perspective to just, you know, get up to where we need to be to maintain that oil prices would stay flat and not have that hockey stick moment. What would that look like? Yeah, fantastic question. And, and one that I think, uh, you know, we have our usual example where the consumer goes to the pump, they fill in gasoline, all is well with the world. Then they go on Facebook and they say, Oh, we should ban the Conoco Willow project. We, we don't need these pipelines. It's like, do you really understand what you know what what you just did? And I think for the vast majority of people, the answer is no. And this is some of the energy ignorance topics uh, that I'm glad you're addressing here. So, what does it take? There's there's two different buckets I can discuss. One is your development project. The other is your exploration project. We have not invested enough in either of those. How do we know this? Because on the first bucket the global capital expenditures towards development is on a downward trend. At the same time, inflation to those projects is rising and the overall global number of barrels produced is rising, which means you should invest more in development, not less as the years go on. On the second bucket, we have not invested enough in exploration. The exploration drills are way down. The success rates are way down. The resources found versus resources consumed ratio is at a very, very low level. So we haven't invested in exploration. On the development cycle, it's about a five to seven year cycle. For a actual physical proof of this, look at International Petroleum Corp. They just said they're going to sanction an oil sands black rod project. The facility doesn't get up to full production until 2028. So it was sanctioned in Q1 2023, mid 2028 is full production, about five and a half years. 
And that's just what they're saying right now. A lot of these projects are getting pushed back. They're going over budget. So five to seven years on those sorts of projects, what needs to be done? They need to sanction the project. This is all they've already found. They've already delineated. They've already discovered. It's already good to go. They need to sanction the project, which means get approval from their board of directors, which a lot of investors are, are not going to want these days. You look at IPCO stock price, what happened when they sanctioned this project, a complete drawdown day uh, or two. So that's the first step. Get the sanction, get the FID, final investment decision, start sourcing your equipment, start sourcing your other uh, uh, engineers and your field staff, everybody else you need to get the project going. You then need to make sure you have all your regulatory approvals completely on track, all done. And then you start getting shovels in the ground. Once you get the shovels in the ground, you start building out the project. It's about a two, three, four year development cycle uh, as, to, as to exactly what they need to do. Some of the equipment these days is running on a 52 to 100 week delay. So they need to make sure that everything can come in before their uh, project needs to be online. Uh, especially when you're ordering custom specific equipment uh, that's made sometimes in Europe and, and, and in Asia. They need to make sure it gets here in time. Um, and once a project is done, it's a slow growth project. These start off very slow. In the case of SEGD specifically, there is, is, is a warm up period where you need to let the steam chamber develop. You need to inject steam, mobilize the oil underground, bring it up, then you produce it. You produce the first few barrels. You then have to make sure all your processing facility is working up to top notch before you can increase your rates. And that's another six, 12, 18 month time frame for that. So really that's what we're talking about. On a new exploration plate, what do you need to do? You need to first spend months, years, looking at public data, looking at logs, looking at core samples, looking at other, other uh, cuttings, uh, mud, mud returns and, and everything else to figure out where do we want to start our project? Where do we want to explore? You go, you figure out, okay, this is where we want to explore. You then go and build out a lease, which takes a few months, uh, get the regulatory approvals to go and, and, and get your drilling done. You then go and, uh, you know, find, find one oil. You find maybe a, just a small, a sliver zone of oil. You then say, okay, this is a, petroleum system exists here. Perfect. You then do more delineation to find a working and mobilized petroleum system. So you can have oil all over the place, but it needs to be oil you can physically produce and in enough quantities that it makes sense to do a development over it. So you then do a full scale commercial study. You drill wells all over the place. You say, okay, we have enough commercially uh, recoverable quantities of oil. We also have a working petroleum system is what we'll call it that can be produced. And this is a, a two, three, five year time period over which you're doing this. In a lot of places where we're still exploring for oil, think Alaska, think North Sea, the Canadian uh, kind of upper areas, uh, winter areas, you can't just drill whenever you want. There's a specific time when it's not swamp and muskeg and, and, and all sorts of road bands going on. So there's a further delay on that because the easy oil has been found. We found oil in the Middle East. We found oil in the deserts and the nice kind of easy to access areas already. So it's getting more and more tougher that way. Once you've got the field explored over a three to, to five year period, you now end up in this development basket, which is another five to seven year cycle after that. So you can see why things are just not as easy um, just to bring oil online. And I will stress this point. We used to have easy oil, conventional easy oil, where yeah. you could go drill these wells in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, and bring on 10, 20, 30,000 barrel per day wells, no exploration required. Those days are long gone. That oil has not only been discovered, it's been produced and it's been consumed. When oil is consumed, it goes into thin air, it's gone. So, we're now dealing with the, the, the boundaries of physics and chemistry and geology and sort of the earth's ge a geography uh, to the places where we're going. And uh, it's just adding to the delays. And of course, let's, let's add another cherry on top, which is labor issues. We don't have the right labor. 
we don't have the right engineers, we don't have the right geologists to go explore this many areas of the world. It used to be 20 years ago, you know, people would be going to Iraq for 60 day shifts to go and, and look after a drilling project. How many young people these days could you convince to go to Iraq for a 60 day project without any breaks? You're just working. Not that many. It's a, it's a mindset shift and it's a lack of uh, knowledge and expertise that's left in the sector, especially to manage a hundred million barrel per day uh, global sort of supply uh, operation. Got it. So the lack of development and exploration, is this a global issue or is this mostly a North American issue? Ah, yes. So it's a global issue, but in various extents. So I think in North America, we don't really have the conventional oil anyway um, to really make a massive dent on global supply. We do have shale, which is less of a sort of technological innovation. It's it's more that they just jammed hundreds of billions of dollars of zero debt, uh, zero interest rate debt into the market, which created this mass influx uh, once they proved out hydraulic fracturing works. So on the Canadian side and the, the North American side, can we develop the oil sands and bring on a few million barrels per day in a decade? Sure, we can do it. We have that already available. So. We do have it in North America. The political will and the financial will is not there. The social support is not there. On a global scale, it's even more of a problem because we don't have the multi hundreds of billions of barrels that the oil sands has easy to access and relatively easy to go. So, so on a global standpoint, the Middle East is going to really suffer from this. They're going to have to invest multi tens of billions of dollars every year in development, in CapEx, because they have old, tired fields. Their current fields that are running, the granddaddy fields, the, the best conventional fields ever that there will be, are, are running, running low. They're, they're now on their decline phase of the Hubbard's curve. Uh, they're looking like they're getting tired. They need more water flood. They need more enhanced oil recovery. So, so really, the world needs to explore more. The world outside of North America, even within North America, needs to explore more. A lot of that will be your deep water offshore drilling, which, which contains these high impact deposits uh, that are yet to be found and then yet to be developed. So the world does have a, call it a, a little bit of excess development uh, reserves that can be produced, that can be developed and produced. But at the same time, the world ex North America produces 75 million barrels per day. So they have a much bigger chunk that they need to maintain. Their decline rates are a little bit higher on their, on their conventional side. And some of these fields are, are really getting to the point where they may just one day water out and finish up. So as we go through these problems, I think the world ex North America has, has a significant exploration issue. Uh, North America itself, if you said, hey, can you see a scenario where North America can increase 5 million barrels per day in 10 years? Yeah, if you gave me, half a trillion dollars to invest in the oil sands, could I do it? Sure, I can do that. Uh, and we can we can get those online in 10 years, not today, in 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, globally, not, not that many fields that can do that, especially given that they produce a lot more, so they need to make up for that decline before they add any new incremental barrels uh, to that. Right. So as we sit approaching end of Q1 2023, how much excess capacity is there on the global market to react to demand shocks or anything like that? Yeah. Okay. So when you talk about excess supply capacity, I think maybe call it a million barrels per day would be your max excess supply. And I'm talking OPEC brings on every barrel. Russia continues to stay where they are. They don't drop off. Uh, we talk about any excess from Nigeria and Libya continuing to stay online. We talk about South America, Ecuador, Peru, uh, Colombia, and then the Argentina, Vaca, Muerte, Shale, everything maximized, and then North America maximized. About a million, maybe just over a million barrels per day of excess uh, spare capacity uh, in case of a demand shock where the world says, hey, we don't care. Bring on every barrel you have, no matter how dirty it is, no matter how high sulfur, high ESG, uh, or low ESG, whatever it is, 
bring it online. Um, that's that's sort of what what you're going to have. Um, but really, to me, the question becomes: once you're past that, how fast is it for you to bring extra other supply online? And the question is: we we don't have it. We don't have it. Scale is at its point where it's tapped out. It can no longer increase a million barrels per year. It just cannot supply that short cycle supply that saved the world from 2014 to 2020. That million barrels per uh, million barrels per day per year of growth that was coming online every year, we don't have it. And shale at this point is teetering on a what happens on the other side of shale because you over uh, produce shale. It's not going to have your typical, your normal uh, uh, overall basin curve. It might have this curve where it goes up at a height and then falls off a cliff this way. Not, right. not quite as dramatic, but at the same time, a lot higher than your conventional deposits. So the question you got to ask yourself is the risk reward of it with all these factors that are here. Uh, you know, what makes sense from a supply demand perspective, as long as demand continues to grow and we're seeing very strong signs of growth out of the emerging markets, uh, including India, Vietnam, Philippines, Nigeria, these high population areas that are now going from motorcycles to vehicles. They're going from bicycles to motorcycles, which by definition is a infinite percent increase in the amount of petroleum you're using on a day-to-day -day basis. Got it. And we're in a very good position because we're having this conversation and we can see the investment potential and opportunity. I'm worried about do we, if oil, if supply and demand is as tight as it is, and there's not that much excess capacity and oil spikes, and there's no more capacity to bring online, what does the world look like at that point? Do we break the entire global economy? And, you know, what does that look like from a global perspective of oil? You know, maybe the floor is now, this is the base that we're in right now for the next cycle, which is around $70 WTI or $60 WTI. What does that look like if oil's stuck at 100, 150? What does that do to the global economy? Yeah, so um, this is a question that many uh, economists have, that many people who invest in oil have as well. So I think we got to just zoom out a bit. 2010 to 14, we averaged $100 a barrel, and the economy went on just fine. There, there was no real big concerns. The concern is when oil sharply rises, there's a huge increase in inflation that year because oil goes into everything. It goes into diesel for the farmers. It goes into diesel to bring all the goods from parts of the world into your supermarket. It goes into the gasoline you're using to go everywhere. So there's a, there's a second, third, fourth order impact of higher energy prices on the economy and inflation. We're now past that. We've, we've gone past that shock year, let's say. We're now in our new normal. Yeah, prices are a lot higher on, on a lot of things, but they're not rising at the same rate as they were previously. So can the world survive 100 dollars $150 oil sustained? Sure, it can. How is it going to survive that? A little bit lower growth. Yes, you're going to see some of the GDPs not rise as much. You're going to see the energy consumption that we're saying 1% per year, maybe goes to 0 0.8, 0 0.7% per year. So a slight decline in that. But the question I really ask, and, and there's two questions here. Number one is, who gets the oil? When we go from energy abundance to energy scarcity, can the Western world jawbone their way and brute force their way into getting that oil for themselves? Or are the developing markets going to say, hey, this oil is allowing us to increase our economy so, so fast and so efficiently, we'll pay more for it. We don't care. We'll pay more for it. And guess what they'll say? We have the refining capacity to refine your oil. So, so keep sending it to us. Who's building the most refineries in the world? It's not the US. It's not Canada. It's not Europe. It's Nigeria. It's Mexico. It's India. It's China. It's your Singapore. It's the Middle East. They realize that to get that oil, you have to refine it. You have to refine it into usable products. And the, the West has to be really careful as to how they're playing their cards here because they might get priced out as the uh, growing economy's population increases and as more people uh, start to use petroleum. And hey, guess what? 
if they don't get to consume the oil, they will refine it for a $30, $40 per barrel margin and send it right back to you so that the West now is paying that excess cost. So these carbon taxes, this ESG mandates that's going on in the Western world are great, nothing wrong with it. They're being pushed too hard where they're affecting our, our energy security, our energy stability. And that's really the one of the points that I would like to get across to some of the viewers uh, and some of the listeners. The second thing is really the the if you don't invest in oil and you don't invest in energy, you're almost not hedged against the rising cost of living and against the increased competition from the East and the emerging markets, right? If if I want to afford the same V8 vehicle or the same heating in my home that I do today in an energy abundant environment or that I used to three or four years ago in an energy abundant environment, I now wanna afford the same qualities of life in an energy scarce environment. I need to make sure I'm somehow hedged myself against the rising cost of energy. The one way to do that, and I'm not advocating for a 100% energy portfolio, I'm just saying some exposure to energy that protects you from that would be a prudent way to kind of uh, protect your quality of life, protect your investments, and protect yourself against the inflation and higher interest rates uh, interest rate uh, costs going forward. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting question that I pose to a lot of people because people say, hey, whether you believe in climate change or not, it doesn't matter. It's if we can reduce emissions, we should. If we can reduce random gases going in the air, we should. And I say, 100% agree with you. Now you answer my question. If you invest a part of your portfolio, portfolio in energy and energy cost doesn't rise and energy stocks stay where they are, isn't it like a free, cheap insurance that it makes sense to buy? And again, I'm not an investment advisor, but I just pose this question to anybody who is strictly against uh, investing in energy. It might give you a different perspective and a way to think about it, um, especially if energy costs do rise. Insurance is is best taken before the fact than in hindsight after the fact. Absolutely. And is there an assumption that's going on with policymakers and kind of governments of the West that you would you would assume that they have to be aware of supply and demand and how tight the oil market is. Is there an underlying assumption that renewables and green energy will be able to, whatever that delta is between the existing supply available and future demand, that green energy will be able to fill that gap? And what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. So green energy is doing a fantastic job. I will say that as an oil and gas investors, uh, as an oil and gas investor, I'm not going to go out and, and berate things. What they're doing is really good. The solar capacity that's coming online in the U.S. and in other parts of Europe and even in in uh, in Asia is is really, you know, something to watch. It's it's really feed. And I'm not talking about installed capacity. I'm talking about generation. Uh, total net generation is is actually looking pretty good. Um, places like Texas, California, and even some of the eastern states, they're doing a pretty good job there. The the wind, I don't believe in as much because it's not as efficient, but uh, either way, what they're doing is a really good job. The problem is the world's energy demand is growing even higher. So it's mm. growing to the point where we need record levels of coal usage in 2022. We got natural gas usage. You saw the price of natural gas last year, record natural gas usage last year. We saw oil demand continue to rise and kind of stabilize now back. And now 2023 is going to be another increase in that. Wind continue to increase, solar continues to increase, and we still don't have enough energy to really sustain kind of the low energy abundant environment that we were in. So this is, I think, what the governments don't realize. They think, hey, if we just pepper the market with uh, a, a, a solar and wind and nuclear and everything else, we now all of a sudden have solved the problem. Well, there's problems to that. We don't have the capacity to scale solar, wind, and EVs to take over the entire market share in the decades that they're saying they can, 2035, 2040. It's completely unreasonable expectations. On top of that, what, what product do we use to mine what goes into solar panels and wind and nuclear? It's diesel. You're, you're increasing diesel consumption as you mine more and more of these uh, rare earths and critical minerals. Um, the, the other thing, of course, is the world's population has kind of shifted in a way where a lot more of them are on the cusp of using petroleum. 
So as there's more and more billions of people in India, in, in Vietnam, China, Philippines, Nigeria, uh, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, that are now starting to use, use petroleum, the number of consumers we have is a lot larger. And this is where the West is kind of stuck in their own little bubble that, hey, if we can just reduce energy consumption of petroleum in, in North America and Europe, will be fine. And it's it's a completely wrong, wrong understanding of the problem because the the other emerging markets of the world are not only a much higher population now, they're also on the cusp, a lot more are on the S-curve cusp of using petroleum, which creates this, this gap in the market uh, that so far has not been filled. We are not installing solar and wind at the scale that would take over petroleum. We're not uh, uh, selling EVs at the same scale that would be required to take away from gasoline demand. That's just the reality of, of, of mathematics. It's, it's, it's a strict watching what's going on. The governments think they can, they can twist this uh, global oil demand line in one or two years. It's not how it works. Any single curve like that is going to have a plateau for a few years, and then you can see what's going to happen. And we're not even at the plateau yet. So mm-hmm. how can you go, that, go out there and claim victory over these things when all you've done is take an incremental demand, not legacy demand? And, mean, and meanwhile, oil demand still continues to grow a percent per year. Um, it's, it's a, they understand the problem. They don't understand the scale of the problem and the scale of the solution that's required to fix it. Um, and the fact that oil is just so efficient, it's just so damn efficient. It's just so cheap compared to like trying to use other other uh, sources of energy that people will always come back to the cheaper source of energy. That's that's just the reality of economics. And maybe arguing against that may work for you to win a few votes. It doesn't work for you in the real world where science is the first and foremost uh, dictating factor in in sort of everything that goes on. Got it. Got it. And so far, you've made a very compelling case for oil and potential, potentially oil equities. Is there anything that would cause you to change your thesis? Anything that could happen from a demand perspective, a supply perspective that would make you stop and say, hey, actually, maybe oil is staying at around $60 for the foreseeable future moving forward? Yeah, very interesting question. One that I get uh, a lot. So maybe I'll provide a more more detailed answer. and. I, I think we should shift, uh, also discuss the the shift of my views from an oil price perspective and from an equity perspective. I think there's there's two different things there, uh, depending on which you're invested in, obviously. So mm-hmm. coming back to oil uh, to begin with, I think this is an undersupplied structural bullish oil, oil thesis that we're in, the cycle that we're in. What fixes it? More, more supply. If there's any indication of more supply to the point that it really becomes material, whether that's new developments, whether that's exploration success, whether that's increasing recovery factors, you could have shale come out and say, hey, we found this new polymer or technology or refracts that are extremely economic and we can increase recovery factors a few percent. It's it's really time to pay attention to those things. In 2014, what caused the end of the undersupplied cycle? Shale coming on the scene, flooding the market with more supply. So as an oil investor, definitely watch for supply. Where are they coming in? And the un- the, the undersupply that we have. So let's say next year, 2024, I see a million barrels per day of new projects coming online. Well, hang on a sec. We're already 2 million barrels per day undersupply next year. And we have another million barrels per day demand coming online, meaning it's not a problem. But if I see indications, hey, next year, there's this, some random field that was discovered somewhere that's bringing on 5 million barrels per day of supply. Okay, now, now your math doesn't quite add up, right? So, so supply is the number one thing to watch. The second thing to watch is credit events. The oil market is a very financialized market. The physical barrel will always win. It will always win the war. But when oil gets into these ranges where the physical market is not extremely tight, the financial market will absolutely clobber the oil investor, as we've seen in the last two weeks. The fundamentals have not changed. Oil inventory continues to draw. Demand is looking good. Supply is not responding. 
yet the price is down from 80 to 68, right? So the financial market will take over when uh, when the physical market is not just tight, when it's not extremely tight. So we need the physical market to get very, very tight. And then we'll see, okay, uh, it takes over from the financial market. Uh, the The one thing, of course, there is when we talk about supply, guess what? We don't have 222 million barrels of SPR that was released last year. So it's it's making a more bullish case that, hey, even in the case of a very tight physical market, they no longer have the tools that they did even 12 months ago to control those prices or to prevent them from kind of staying where they should to elicit the proper supply response. Now, what will make me bearish on my equities? If oil price, let's say, 12 months from now, six months from now is $120 a barrel. Let's just run a scenario here. And my oil equities are trading at seven times free cash flow, eight times free cash flow. I will sell. I will be completely out of the market despite oil price staying at $120 a barrel or possibly even going higher. So it's always about risk reward. Don't mistake a bullish oil cycle or a bullish investment in equities, period. They are completely different topics. Uh, you need to have your own exit strategies, your own exit cases. Uh, I'm not saying that oil uh, equities at seven times free cash flow at 120 is a bad investment. It just fits a different kind of investor. Maybe the investor wants a dividend income. Maybe they are willing to bet on even higher oil prices. Maybe they're willing to bet that multiples will, will re-rate to 10 times free cash flow, right? There's a different mandate that people have. I can't speak for them. My understanding always has been eight times free cash flow is my target. Once we start getting close to that, and I'm not saying at $60 a barrel, I'm saying eight times free cash flow at a hundred plus dollars per barrel, I would begin trimming my positions and possibly even selling out entirely. I've always been fully transparent about this. Um, and hey, maybe people buy my, my stocks and they make another hundred percent off that over the next five years. But I run everything on a risk reward model. I run everything on an expected value model. And hey, if the expected value is even up and down, doesn't quite make for a good investment, does it? Unless you're willing to take on risk. And if you're willing to take on risk, this industry is one of the most fun industries you can invest in uh, and one of the most painful industries you can invest in as well. Got it. And Shabam, I, I'm going to have to listen to this a couple of times. This was an absolute masterclass. And thanks for sharing so much info. As we wrap up here, is there anywhere that we can send folks who are hearing your voice from the first time and want to learn a bit more about what you do and how you, uh, you know, serve, serve your clients? Yeah, you betcha for sure. So um, I will say up front, everything I do is completely pro bono. It's completely free. So if any, if you get a message or an email saying we can sell you a membership or anything, it's it's not true. Um, there's a lot of bots and stuff out there. So so I better make sure of that. But I'm most active on my Twitter at White Tundra SG. Uh, I I like to post something or the other daily relating to supply, demand, uh, uh, petroleum engineering topics, inventories, something or the other. I don't really uh, uh, reply to the comments or anything too much, just just given uh, we're still a one-man shop here, but uh, I do like to post something every so often. Well, every day is my goal. On that, you, you can DM me there. You know, I try to respond to every DM, uh, no matter what the question is, or at least move you to another video that I've done or another interview I've done where the answer is there. I also do Sunday Zoom sessions. So every Sunday or second Sunday, we will have... Uh, sessions on company deep uh, deep dive analysis. We'll have well by well results. We will have technical petroleum engineering sessions. We have macro outlooks every three to six months that I do. Everything is on YouTube. So if you go to White Tundra Investments on YouTube, you can look at the recordings of every single one in the past. The 2022 recordings were company by company analysis. I covered about 50 to 60 to 70 companies. We went into their financials. We went into their wells their management teams, their acreage, uh, the way they conduct business, everything. And the 2023 is now more of a macro and engineering sessions. So I talk about more about enhanced oil recovery. I talk about offshore platforms and how they function. Where are the offshore sources of supply going forward? I talk about Colombian geopolitical risks. So more, more overall broad topics because the company analysis are now already there. They're recorded. Anybody can view them. 
so yeah, if you would like to join for those, the information is on my website. Scroll to the bottom under events. Uh, the next one will be this Sunday. We will be talking about global offshore, uh, a supply that's going to come online, the break-even cost, and which countries have that have that uh, development potential. So um, yeah, just like to share as much as possible. I'm always open to new suggestions. I just did a Q4 review. So for anybody looking for new companies to invest in, you want more exposure to other companies. I went through about 40 to 45 companies and kind of how their 2022 went, how their Q4 went, what are some things to watch for, which may give the new investor a really good uh, a start, a head start, without having to go through financials and corporate presentations, uh, trying to figure out what to do. So yeah, that's that's kind of the bulk of my uh, content. I do I do like to write a few articles here and there. I've been slacking on that uh, just because I enjoy the video format a lot more than than nerding out and and writing. And those uh, videos are uh, they're dense in a good way. Like sit down mm -hmm. with you know some foods over lunch or a glass of wine in the evening and just kind of relax into it and take some yep. notes because uh, they are very thorough. It's not a five minute clip on YouTube. It's a four hour master class <laughs> on whatever you're diving into. Certainly, certainly no, appreciate the support for sure. I think this is a $10 trillion industry and it deserves respect. If you're going to invest in oil and the volatility that comes with that, you need to understand what oil is, how it works, how the investments work, how they're valued, et cetera, et cetera. So I try to cover all of those. And um, yeah, my portfolio as well, as we had mentioned earlier, is fully public. Uh, I like to update it once a month. I haven't made any changes in the last two months or so to my portfolio. So I haven't really updated it on the website, but fully disclosed. And uh, yeah, my email is also always open for anybody that would like to uh, have any further questions or discussions. And uh, thanks for having me on, Ryan. Yeah, awesome stuff. And I'd love to have you back on here in a couple months as your thesis unfolds and do a bit of an oil check in and see what's going on globally. Right on. No, right on, fun. sir. Thank you.